the Gita has certain sections that uh, through the years have become favorite sections, most important sections, some full chapters, chapter 12, chapter 15. Uh, this chapter 2 uh, is, is one of the most important chapters and for two different reasons. The, this, is, this is our Jnana Yoga chapter, so this will be the path of knowledge. The Gita is a, a little bit like Swami Vivekananda. When it talks about one path, that's everything. So Swamiji used to confuse people. Huh? When he was talking about devotion, he would praise it so much, but Jnana praised it so much, and they would say, Swamiji, yesterday you said this about that, and today you're saying this about that. So a little bit similar. So we'll see that uh, Jnana Yoga is praised far above Karma Yoga and everything else, because that's, that's the chapter, and that's the, the emphasis. But uh, the first portion, the Jnana, we can really say the Jnana Yoga portion, is famous because it gives us the uh, description of the, of, the, of the Atman, that the Atman is unborn and undying. And we get a real distinction between Jiva Atman and the Atman. When it talks about the Jiva Atman, we're talking about well, the, the, the body goes, we get a new set of clothes, and we go on and on, and there's a continuity. When we talk about the Atman, it's never born, it never dies, it's uh, uh, something transcendent, something one with the absolute reality. And that portion is generally chanted uh, at the time of the memorial service, with the passing away of something very auspicious to chant uh, those verses from chapter 2. This uh, second important section is called Stita Pragna section. And the Stita Pragna uh, refers to a sage who is established in the highest type of, of wisdom. Now, we, we will find that there are differences of opinion. I have Shankaracharya's commentary here, just for fun. <laughs> just for fun, and you'll see his translation, the translation will be according to his commentary. Uh, I mentioned yesterday some of the uh, idiosyncrasies of Shankaracharya. Uh, with regard to this Adhikaragada and, and certain other things, his emphasis on sannyasa, his emphasis on, on, on knowledge. So uh, it'll be interesting, we can compare to some of the other translations that you, that you have there. Anyhow, this Tita Prajna section, we'll have a few initial questions. We can discuss them at the very beginning, but then at the end we can also discuss it when we have a better understanding. Is everyone familiar a little bit with this Stita Pragna section? Okay. Now, who does it refer to? Stita Pragna. A realized soul. A realized soul. Okay. In this Viveka Tudamani, which is also attributed to Shankaracharya, there's a long section that merges, it starts out with the, with the definition of Stita Pragna, and it goes to the definition of the Jivan Mukta. So uh, there we get the impression, because the qualities are more or less the same, there's a distinction in terminology, but uh, it, we don't get the, the uh, Jivan Mukta as any type of uh, distinction from the Stita Pragna. So what is a Jivan Mukta? Okay, so what does it mean exactly? What's the distinctive feature of a Jivan Mukta? Okay, Stita Pragna. <laughs> okay. Realize. <laughs> the, the, uh, the concept of a Jivan Mukta uh, Jivan Mukta or the concept of Jivan Mukti. What does it mean? Uh, we have different, two different main type distinctions of Mukti. One is Videha, Mukti, the other is Jivan Mukti. Then we'll see that even with this Videha means after the body falls. Even with this Videha Mukti, we'll have all different schools of, of, uh, of and different opinions on this. So we'll have five different types of Mukti. Uh, this is Sadhanya, Sarupya, so all different things. Uh, so you, uh, that, uh, what is that state of realization? Do we, do we merge with the Brahman? 
Do we live in the presence of God? Do we take the qualities of God? These will all be dualistic schools. We'll discuss these things. So, uh, if if uh, so, the distinctive feature. Why do we have, we have this concept of jivan mukti as opposed to vidya mukti? Because uh, the the concept is that uh, if there is some remaining prarabdha karma then at least the body will continue. We, we have this tie-in, this God-realization or self-realization when someone attains to illumination. Then uh, we have this very famous verse from Mundaka Upanishad that three things happen. One is that all, all the doubts, samshaya, all the doubts are removed. Then all the knots of the heart, that means any, any uh, confusion that we have in the mind, all of that is, is uh, eliminated. And then, kshyante tatantasya karmani, then all of the karma gets exhausted. Now, the exception is with this prarabdha karma. Prarabdha karma is that which uh, actions that were performed in the previous lifetime, which have already begun to bear fruit and cannot be changed. Now, Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother, they say uh, that it can be very much reduced. Uh, if because of uh, our, this old karma, uh, we're, so we're destined in this lifetime to have a sword go through our belly. Uh, and we become great devotees of God, we, we attain great devotion and everything. Maybe we'll get pricked with a little pin, something like that. It can be reduced that way. So just to pay honor to this, this theory of parabdha, or they could have said it's eliminated, but they're, they're, they want to at least pay honor to it, that there's some truth to it. But one of the things about parabdha karma is that it's supposed to uh, determine length of life. So if we attain to God realization and we still have this parabdha karma, then we continue to live in the world as a jivan mukta. And at the time of death, then uh, we, we attain to that ultimate and final liberation. Except if we've done a lot of good things. Huh? We have a lot of punya, we have a lot of merit. That has to be enjoyed first. Mm -hmm. So then they have this concept, the third thing called kramamukti. Kramamukti, so then we have to go to some Brahmaloka or something and enjoy that, then from there we have illumination. We don't, but we won't be reborn in a human body. Now, Shankaracharya will make a big point that the sthita pragya will have to be a sannyasin. Mm -hmm. This is his bias. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have to accept it. Bias means he's, he's, he has an obligation to be consistent in his philosophy. But when we, when we observe and we see uh, who is it that has these qualities, we'll find that there'll be sometimes the householders that have it more. Because these householders, many of them have to bear uh, tremendous ups and downs in life. And then we really, that's the test. Those who renounce everything, don't have any family problems, this and that, then uh, we don't see that real test. Can they remain unmoved in the midst of, of all the problems of life and uh, all the joys of life and sorrows of life and all that? They don't have the uh, obligation to uh, remain <coughs> steady and fixed because uh, their life is, is a rather dull, boring life. That's a, that's a, <laughs> yeah. So I, my understanding <coughs> and uh, there's nothing to indicate here that it has to be uh, someone who has renounced to everything. Stita Pragna, it can simply be somebody who uh, is very much established in the highest type of, of wisdom. Now, will it just be, because we'll see the, the descriptions that we get, uh, will, these, will these just apply to someone on the path of knowledge, Jnana Yoga? Shouldn't. Shouldn't. Yeah, it should be. Everybody. <coughs> Everybody who realizes. Who realizes. 
You've read all of these descriptions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> would you yeah. say Would you say it's a good description of of uh, Swami Vivekananda? Yes. Of course. No. Why not? Yeah. Because uh, there are instances in his life where he got angry or where he was very passionate about different things. How about Sri Ramakrishna? So, there are some exceptions. How about Holy Mother? Yeah. Okay. Now, I, I, yes. I do think, and I cannot work without analogy. Yeah. Just like it's a burnt rope, yes. it's like a rope. It's, of course, copied from somewhere else. Or it's a sword, but it's not really cannot cut. I think Swamiji's angers and Swamiji's things were more on outer shell. I don't think way inside uh, he was not, never not a stupid remedy. How about his grief? How about his mourning? How about when Goodwin died and others? So the same with the and mother. Yeah. Was that just a show? Um, they lived two lives. One is the so-called human life, okay. where, like Thakur broke his arm and it hurt him, and he was crying and complaining to everyone. <laughs> he complained about everything. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right. His leg is a little swollen, and he pushed it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you also get that when you push your leg? <laughs> we have a word for him called fetch. Anybody know that word? Fetch. <laughs> fetch. 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 K V E T C H. The Yiddish word. The Yiddish word. <laughs> The Yiddish word fetch. He's always fetching. <laughs> yeah. Always complaining. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm joking. Of course. <laughs> My point is that first of all, two things. My first question was, is it just a gani? Now, how about someone on the path of devotion? Would, would their qu the characteristics be like this? Yes. Can be. Yeah. You can be. Yeah. Yes. We won't. We won't find them singing and dancing and doing all sorts of things. Now the curious thing is, I mentioned also last night that uh, in chapter 12 we get a description of, of the perfect bhakta. Yes, the same thing. And exactly the same. Same quality. Okay, yeah. now, do we, do we conclude from this that every God-realized soul will have all of these same types of qualities and attributes and the description will be the same? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. No, no, it's here. Anybody? I'll, I'll raise my hand. No. <laughs> okay. Now, Sri Ramakrishna says, first of all, uh, well, let's go back. Now, are we talking about the state of, 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 of the, the jnani, who has this highest realization, or the big jnani? And will we make a distinction? Right. What's, according to Sri Ramakrishna, the jnani is someone who realizes the highest truth, but when he comes back down and uh, lives in the world again, like an ordinary person, so-called, then he's a big jnani and he has a different vision of, of things. So there we'll have two types. Huh? We'll have the jnani and we'll have the bhakti. He says the eye of the one keeps the ego of devotion, the other keeps the ego of knowledge. Right. Okay. Now, Sri Ramakrishna, when, he's, when he talks about what is the nature of a God-realized soul, right? he gives four illustrations, none of them are like this. These four illustrations are found both in the Bhagavata Purana and Viveka Chudamani. In both places we find it the same thing. Anyone know what they are? Um, Jadavad. Jadavad. Okay. Um, uh, Pishatyavad. Pishatyavad. And then uh, Unma Unmadavad. And, and, and Balavad. Balavad. Okay. So he says that sometimes they behave like a, a madman. Okay? So that was Sri Ramakrishna that was also like that. Sometimes like a, a madman, someone who drank too much. Thakur was always reeling. He was afraid that people would think he was drunk. Huh? Someone would have to hold him up. Sometimes uh, he would be in that state, someone would hold him up, he said, let go, you rascal, they'll think that I'm drunk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then Pishakyabat, that means making no distinction between purity and impurity. Yeah. You remember the Purnikyani who came to Dakshineshwar. There was a, a sadhu who came 
wearing one Torin sneaker and carrying a potted mango plant, huh? and look at the other just like a crazy person. And he went into the temple and he chanted and the whole temple shook and everything. And uh, uh, when he went out, who uh, was it? Uh, Ridoy. 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 Yeah. ran after him. And he threw a brick at him and didn't want him. Anyhow, he caught him. And then he asked her, are you a, a pointed yani? Are you a perfect nowhere garment? And he admitted. And then he said, when you make no distinction between this is filthy ditch water and this pure wood of Ganga, then you'll know you've attained perfect knowledge. So this is Pishatya, but they don't distinguish between pure and impure. This is the path of Tantra, actually. When Sri Ramakrishna did all, all his Tantric practices, he had to do things like that. That uh, you take fe feces from a jackal, you touch it to your tongue. What is it? Is it just three gunas touching three gunas? Only in, in our mind we think something impure. We make that, that distinction. Otherwise, what is it? Mm -hmm. It's just matter touching matter. So, anyhow, this is, this is a, a second type, Pishachivat. Then, Jadavat. Sometimes, uh, we see all of these in the life of Sri Krishna. Mm -hmm. It will be just like a stump, unmoving, like an inner thing, lost in Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Right? And Bhagavat, no attachment to anything. Like a child, that uh, they'll cry and scream if they don't get what they want, the next minute they'll throw it away. Right. So he says, no attachment. Uh, we don't get a fifth one called Stita Karnia. <coughs> now my point is that the, the, the way someone will behave after God realization doesn't depend so much on whether it's the path of knowledge or the path of devotion, because in Gita it's the same description. Right? It depends more on the personality of the individual, there will be different types of people. Now, in the case of Sri Ramakrishna and, and the Holy Mother and, and Swamiji, as the avatar or the Ishwara Koti, they uh, took on more of human qualities than even an ordinary person who attains to a state of God realization, because uh, no one would be able to, to identify with them. We wouldn't, uh, if they were so far above us and we saw that, that they didn't weep the way we weep and they didn't laugh the way we laugh, we couldn't relate to them. We wouldn't be able to, to recognize them and, and, and learn from them that way. So uh, he always said when God takes human form that he takes on all of the qualities of an ordinary human being. Uh, Fande, Brahma Parikande. So when, when Brahman itself falls into the snares of the five elements, that means take the human body, then it weeps. And he used to say, uh, the Rama wept for Sita. Huh? So, so we see that these human qualities can still be there after God realization for a certain type of individual, but uh, you gave two good examples, but they don't have any <coughs> binding power. The example of, of the string. Tucker gave both these illustrations. That uh, if, if you have a string and, and you uh, set it on fire and the whole thing burns, and very quickly it will burn, and it will leave uh, just ash, a little trail of ash, it will be the same shape and it will look the same as the string. But the string can be used to tie something. Okay. This can't be used for anything. He says you puff on it and the whole thing disappears. Mm -hmm. So, Saturag, Joledag, they have this expression. The anger of a holy person is, is like a mark on water, something like that. And the, uh, the sword, you have a sword of steel, and you touch it to this philosopher's stone, and it turns into gold. Now it looks the same, has the same shape and, and everything, but it can't be used to injure anyone. Gold is too soft a metal. It can't be used in battle that way. So the God-realized soul will keep the same uh, personality traits to a large extent. Same likes and dislikes to a large extent. 
but they're, they'll have no binding power anymore. So what, what the real point that I'm trying to make is don't think that every God-realized soul will, will be a stita prajna as we read about it here. And don't think that if we, if we read that, uh, yes, Swamiji got very angry and he yelled at this person and, and, and Thakur was, was weeping, for the, that they're not God, perfect God-realized souls. That this is one paradigm among many possible <coughs> paradigms. There, there's an endless variety. We'll have someone like Chaitanya Deva, huh? constantly singing and dancing. There's nothing here about a stita prajna, about a, uh, a God realized soul, a, a given Bhutto, or even uh, avatar, singing and dancing. So this isn't meant to be uh, an, uh, an exclusive, all comprehensive uh, description of each and every perfect God realized soul. This is one particular type, and then the essential feature, and, and this will be throughout the Gita. The essential feature will be evenness and calmness, and and being unmoving in the midst of, of everything. That would be the essential feature. Now, did Swamiji have that? Of course, he had that. Uh, underlying everything else, that was overriding. That was, the, of course, he had that. But he had this other element to his personality, and when we think about it, uh, which would we rather have? Would we rather have the company of a stita pragna like this, or would we ra- rather have the, the company of a of the Shravi Krishna and the Holy Mother? Okay. Because what attracts us to Thakur and Ma is it is it the divinity shining through? Or is it their, their divine personality? Is that, that tremendous personality, the force of their personality, Swamiji? It was the force of his personality that, that, that has conquered the, the world. It was that personality with that light of God realization behind it shining through. Huh? So, uh, on the one hand, when we read the Stita Pragna section, if we look very carefully at what Sri Ramakrishna says, this, this will apply more to what he calls the, someone who attains the state of Jnana. And he wasn't very flattering when he spoke about that. He would talk about, look at these ancient rishis, how they were afraid of being attached. They would leave their ashram early morning, spend the whole day in meditation, wouldn't look here or there. Uh, he, he said they were a little bit cowardly that way. And uh, he wanted someone to be like the expert dice player who would engage in the game and be an expert. He wants a four, he gets a four. He wants a six, he gets a six like that. So uh, this Tita Pragna uh, represents a very, very high spiritual ideal. Now, is it only the God-realized soul, Tita Pragna? And why, and what is the importance of this? Why, I mean, Arjun is asking, why is he asking? First of all, the, this, uh, if you look at the verses before this, then uh, Sri Krishna is telling him about well, what God-realization is like. Huh? So naturally he's curious. So he, he wants to know what are the qualities and characteristics of a, of a God-realized soul. Now, is it just so he can recognize one? Hmm? So what's the point? To attain to that state. Or so, we have to look upon all of these qualities and characteristics as uh, transformative qualities that we want to bring into our lives in order to become a stita pragna. Now, this looks to be like uh, some type of contradiction. Mm. That uh, we can only become a, a stita pragna if we, if we attain to a state of perfect equanimity, if we have no desires, this and that. And we can only reach that state of desirelessness if we become a stita pragna. Right. So it's circular. Now, a very nice thing that's, uh, that I read here 
that if it be held, this is from Shankaracharya's commentary, or Anandagiri, which was also a, <coughs> a, a great uh, uh, philosophical and spiritual figure. He, was, he wrote uh, commentaries on, on almost all of, of Shankaracharya's commentaries, sub-commentaries. If it be held that attachment cannot be eliminated without the knowledge of Brahman, and at the same time that the knowledge of Brahman cannot arise until attachment is eradicated, <clears throat> then we get involved in a vicious circle. In answer, it is said that gross attachments are eliminated through discrimination, which restrains the senses from being overpowered by objects. That means we have to try uh, through the process of discrimination as far as we can to take care of these main uh, problems, main obstacles. Did you lose me? Yes. <laughs> and the ultimate uh, freedom from all desires will only come after, after illumination. Yeah, I think a few Oh, good. Okay. So, can I take this off? You can continue. Okay. Okay. So, we will find that from a practical point of view, we are not getting all of these teachings so we can recognize who is a God relay. So, we're getting all of these teachings so that we can become one that we can incorporate all of these uh, spiritual attitudes into our own life as far as possible, knowing that uh, they won't fully manifest until we have that highest realization. Now, this is a process which is called Aropa, Aropkora. In Bengali, you'll find that Sri Ramakrishna uses this term all of the time, constantly using this, this, this very important concept. Adhyaropa, Aropa, oh, now we have no light. <laughs> okay, yeah. This, uh, according to the, to the path of, of knowledge, this is false uh, superimposition. We're trying to get rid of it. Now, the, the one way to get rid of it is by superimposing something that will be, that will be beneficial and helpful to, to us. This is also the, the whole point of uh, this uh, Ish, Ishavasya Saram, the first verse of the Isha Upanishad, Everything is to be covered with, with God. So that means that we're superimposing some idea of divinity when we don't see it in order to see it. Mm -hmm. In order for it to become real. So if, if, I, if I want to see God within everybody, how do I do it? I superimpose that idea of divinity on everyone until I really feel it as something real. Swami Ashokananda, he was asked once, how do we see God in others? And he said, by seeing God in others. That means just through the force of our will that, that, that we, we convince ourselves, we tell ourselves. Swamiji says that all the time. Tell yourselves over and over again huh? that I am I'm the infinite, absolute, the universe, the one with the universe. Show all the time. Yeah, so, so we, we can say this so home without, without knowing that it's true in order to realize the truth of it. So this, this, uh, so we, we superimpose these ideas. So we, we try to do these things. Uh, we try to, uh, say, adopt a spiritual attitude. Generally, he's talking about these different bhavas when he talks about this uh, auto. That uh, uh, I, I tell myself that uh, I'm a child of the Divine Mother. Now, what does that do? That means that I'm not thinking of myself as a physical body. If it's from a biological point of view, I'm the child of my biological parents. That means if I convince myself I'm a child of a mother, I'm thinking of myself as a spiritual being. So by adopting that attitude and living in that attitude, it starts to become real to us and then we can have the realization of it. So these qualities are all meant to uh, help us realize and to uh, have that high truth because uh, they are also the means to realization, the means and the effect of both. So these are meant for sadhanas. This is a type of spiritual practice where 
we look at the qualities of a God realized soul and we try to adopt those and cultivate those in our own lives. Now, I was, was telling you earlier that Shankaracharya places great emphasis on this path of knowledge coming after the path of, of action. First Karma Yoga and then Jnana Yoga. And that Jnana Yoga uh, means if we give up karma, that we, we finished our karma, we give that up, that means that we become sannyasis, that we renounce everything. Now Sri Ramakrishna said no. He said that yes, we have to all renounce, but it can be done mentally. It doesn't have to be done formally. So it's not so contradictory. But he talks about two different types of, of sannyasa. Mm. One is called vidvat. Vidvat means that uh, after attaining perfect knowledge, one automatically everything falls off. Huh? Then there are no attachments, no, uh, no one will continue to live in the world or anything, and it'll be automatic vidvat sannyasa. So that means after, after obtaining full uh, knowledge and realization. The other is vividisha. That means we take sannyasa uh, with a desire, with a desire for, uh, for realization, a desire for knowledge. So they say that these, these teachings of this uh, sthita pragya are meant for both. Now from our point of view that means that uh, these are, are meant for someone on the path. And also, these are things that automatically come for someone who attains God-realization. So, uh, we, we have to understand that when we read the characteristics of the Stita Pragna, that this is something that we are supposed to try to emulate. You know this uh, concept, the imitation of Christ. There was a, a book that was written uh, uh, on this... Uh, with this idea that uh, Swamiji liked very much when he traveled throughout India. He kept two books. One was a Gita and the other was Imitation of Christ. And he even wrote a, a Bengali introduction to it. He was very fond of that idea. We find this in, in all religions. That uh, even we take what are the qualities of God in most religions. There's the love and compassion and, and justice and righteousness and all of that that we look at upon those qualities and we try to emulate them and we try to take these godly qualities into ourselves. So this is what we're trying to do with this Stita Pragna section. We're taking the qualities of the God, realized soul, however we understand it, as a jnani, as a vijnani, uh, and utilize them, try to incorporate them into our own, our own lives. Now what does that mean? How do we do that? If uh, someone insults us and, and uh, we feel that urge to get angry, we check it. A lot of this is simply willpower and, and discrimination and understanding uh, what things are helpful, what things are not helpful, what things uh, make our lives more miserable. It's a very common sense things. And all of these qualities are helpful for everybody, even those who are not interested in spiritual life. That's the other nice thing. When we talk about mukti, what does mukti mean? Does it only mean this freedom from rebirth? No. We want to be free. We want to be free from the passions. We want to be free from desires. We want to be free from the ego. We want to be free from smallness. We want to be free from envy and anger and all of these are the things that bind us and make life miserable. We want to be free from selfishness. And uh, no one has to uh, you know, think I'm devoting my life to God and God realization. He has to realize that uh, I myself am the cause of, of my misery because I'm clinging to all of these things and, and I'm a slave to them. I want to be free from them. So this is also a, a very important aspect to this. There's one verse from Gita which I love, one of my favorite verses. It says that... Uh, so someone who is able to withstand this, this terrible power 
this force that's driving us of the anger and, and, and desire and jealousy and greed, all of that. Someone who can withstand all of that here and now, not just the end of life, here and now. This person, we get two descriptions, that this person is yukta, this person is a person of, of real control. What is the second one? Sukhi. Happy. This is a happy person. Happy. Yeah. So we have to always remember that. People will say, why go through life not just enjoying all of this? And do all? Mm -hmm. Because there's no real ultimate happiness in it. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very important that it's added there. It's not someone is, is a real yogi. Not only that, but they're a happy person. So we have to always remember that. Okay, so this is a very long introduction to this section. Uh, we will start with the actual verse 54, because this is the question that uh, Arjuna asked to Krishna. Stita pragnyasya ka bhasha. So, uh, how does the stita pragnya, someone who is established, established in wisdom, how does such a person speak? So, what he's really saying is that uh, what are the ordinary signs of such a person? Is, is the person, do they become silent? Uh, do they become wise that they can give great lectures this and that he, he's, he's curious he wants to know first of all unless this state of God realization is attractive and appealing to us we won't be interested in it so part of it is a little curiosity you know what will I get out of it huh? if, uh, what changes will take place in me well, I have to remain silent. I won't be able to talk. Abhasya, samadhista shikeshava. Now, the samadhista. Uh, those who read the the gospel of Shri Krishna, Bengali, you'll find the samadhisto. Samadhisto term comes over and over and over again. The talker went into samadhi. So samadhista. This 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 means. Uh, it can be interpreted in different ways, but it means someone who is established in samadhi. Now, Shankaracharya, for some reason, doesn't like this. And he says that uh, samadhi will mean some type of enlightenment. So someone who is established in enlightenment. We can take it in both senses, of course. But uh, for Sri Ramakrishna, we, we find that samadhi is tough. That means that uh, someone is, is able to concentrate the mind. Samadhi really means full concentration. can concentrate the mind to such an extent that everything else gets forgotten, that it gets merged in, in God. And uh, someone can get established in this. Now, what is the difference between experiencing it and being established in it? We have the example of Swami Brahmananda. Swami Brahmananda had this experience of samadhi many times. Whether we say Nirvikalpa, that's a different story, but just through the touch of Sri Ramakrishna, and Thakur was very aware of, of when these things happened. He used to tell them, you see where you're sitting? Rakhal was sitting there one day, massaging my feet, and he went to ecstasy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Rakhal, Swami Brahmananda, had had this uh, highest experience, uh, and all the direct disciples, through the touch of Sri Ramakrishna, they had that experience. Swami Brahmananda, more than any of the other disciples probably, uh, spent long years in, in the very intense spiritual practice in meditation, long hours in, in meditation. And one day his, uh, uh, Vijay Krishna Goswami, who was previously a member of the Brahma Samaj, but had left, and he became a great saint himself. And, and he very he loved Thakur very much, and Thakur loved him. He was a very wonderful person. Mm -hmm. He went up to this uh, Rakhav, and he said to him, uh, you received everything from Sri Ramakrishna. Why so much of this intense spiritual practice and everything? And he said, yes, I had the highest experience through the touch of Sri Ramakrishna, but I want to become established in it. I wanted to become my very own. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so he spent longer, then he came back and somebody asked him, have you achieved that? He said, yes. <laughs> so a little distinction. So this is uh, Samadhi's So this is someone who at will 
can can bring the mind up to that highest level. Sri Ramakrishna, he had to do everything in his power to keep his mind from going up the, to that highest level. He was so established in it that the mind automatically would go there. So he had to have the little tricks. He would say, I, I'll eat something now, or I'll do this, or sing some song. Or he would have to do something to keep his mind a little bit down. You won't find too many examples of it. <laughs> something unique, unique to him. But uh, uh, Holy Mother uh, would go into this state of samadhi. She could do it whenever she wanted. She also liked it. They, they knew why they came. They had a mission in life. So that they had to keep their mind uh, on a lower level to a certain extent. So samadhi is okay. And then stita dhi. Stita dhi means more or less the same thing that the intellect is firm, that uh, is unmoving, we'll find that, that that uh, that'll be a defining feature, that our mind is not at the mercy of external things. External things also means uh, internal emotions. It is not at the mercy of, uh, of uh, external objects or uh, the different ups and downs of life and everything, that we, we remain firm like a rock. Kodasta. We have this uh, expression we'll find in, in Gita. They give the example of the, the anvil. Huh? That you, no matter how many blows you can give the anvil with the hammer when you're trying to... Uh, the blacksmith is, is trying to make something, uh, the anvil remains unmoved. So, stita dhi, kimbra How does he speak? So, we have the bhasha. We had... Uh, uh, What is the difference? Oh, the first one will be Bhasha will be what is the description? So then how does he speak? Him Asita, how does he sit? And Varajita him, how does he walk? So just in a very general question. What, just in general, what are the qualities of such a person who attains to the state of God realization? How does he Yeah. How does he walk? Yeah. We don't have to take it too literally. You have to sit like other people sit. <laughs> But, but what it means is uh, you say he's perfectly transformed is he transformed in these ordinary ways or is it something different and, uh, so this is curiosity but for our sake it may be his curiosity but the answer this is for us for our benefit then we get the, the, the beginning of this <coughs> the prajahati yada kaman ok so the first thing is Parajahati, have to abandon, to abandon all desires. Sarvan, all of them, parta o parta manogatan, all of these that are lodged in the heart, all of these desires that have become part of our very being. So this is the first part. Atman yeva, so then, well, where is our contentment? If we, we don't have desires to fulfill, our contentment now comes because we have a certain desire and then we fulfill it and we're content for, for the time being. Huh? Then we, have we have a desire, then another one comes, another one comes. Now, if we, if we don't replace it with anything, then life is dull and dry. Huh? So it says, Atmani eva atmana tushtaha. Our contentment is in the self, by the self, in the self. Now, can we even imagine that, that state? Mm -hmm. First of all, do we know what this Atman is? Do we, what, what do we mean by this Atman, huh? by the Self? There have to be moments in our lives when we have perfect contentment and we feel just at peace with ourselves. That uh, I have everything I want, I don't require anything else, that uh, everything I have is, is within, it's, it's something that comes to us. It's very hard to explain. But unless we have that, we won't be able to get rid of these other desires. So, stita pragna So, that such a person is, is called stita pragna. Now, we get a very big question. That how does one abandon all desires and what does it mean and how do we do it? <coughs> is it possible? to get rid of all desires. Well, they 
<laughs> huh? Yes? Can you do it? No desires for anything? Even to come to the center? <laughs> the ashram? Huh? If we look at the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna, we find that his understanding of this question of desire is extremely subtle. That there'll be, there'll be a, a whole different. We can have we can have a dozen different, different categories of desires, and each one is dealt with in a different way. He himself talks about uh, what he calls these. These are more or less harmless desires. Now, if we have a, a desire, somebody tells us that if you if you go to this pizza place, it's the best pizza you've ever had. <laughs> you you think you've had pizza, you haven't had pizza until you go to this place. So the desire comes. Now, if I spend the rest of my life saying, No, I won't I won't have any desire for that pizza. Huh? Is that an intelligent thing to do? What does a takwa say? Yeah, go have the peace. Try it. Try it. Now we try it. We find out that it's, it's not so good. We say, ah, it's not special. We find out that oh, it's really fantastic. We say, ah, really fantastic. Now, uh, will will we will the desire to have pizza increase each time we have a piece of pizza? Yeah. No, not necessarily. Now this is another distinction that we read uh, <laughs> hey, that pouring ghee on the fire, the fire only gets gray we, we think we're pouring it out, we're putting out the fire when we pour ghee, we're simply making it burn brighter. There are, there are some desires like that mm. and those desires we just say no. There are some desires that uh, we fulfill it and then ah, every once in a while, yeah I haven't had that pizza for months. It was good. Let me have some more. So what? Yeah. Harmless. Then there are others, or or we say, yes, everyone is running after this. It's not such a big deal. Then we're finished with it. So Sri Ramakrishna did that. He had several desires, funny desires. Huh? He he said, let me see. I have this little desire. I see. Uh, as he said, when I was young, people said that, oh, you Brahmins think you know how to cook. These these uh, blacksmith people, the Kamar Pukur, it was the Kamars, they were, they were the blacksmiths, the blacksmith uh, village. He said they really know how to cook. And so the desire came and he said, yes, let me try the doll of the, of the blacksmith family. So he went he said, I had it. He said, it was good, but it tasted like the blacksmith. I mean, this was the smoke from the fire and all of that and everything. So the, then there's uh, some very famous sweetmeat places in Calcutta. Right. He had a little desire. Mm -hmm. So whatever desire he had, Matur Baba would fulfill it. Yeah. So we brought all this with me. It's then Takwa said, yes. I put it in my tongue on one side, I on the other side and everything. I saw and he said, oh, this is what it means to eat. Yeah, it's yeah. such a nice thing. It lasts for a few seconds. It'll come out the other side like everything else does. <laughs> <laughs> what is the special thing about it? The Hubble Bubble. He said, oh, the fancy Hubble Bubble. <laughs> Made of silver and this and that. And he got it, and he did it on one side, lying on the other side, and then he said, this is what it means, and he threw the whole thing away. And he went in a shawl, Mata mm -hmm. got a shawl with the gold embroidery and all of that, very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. Talked a word for a while, strutting back and forth. He said, oh, this is what it means to wear a fancy shawl. It only increases the ones around, yes. How will it help anything else? And then he threw it off and started stepping on it and spinning yeah. on it. Mother Baba said, no, 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 Baba, let me return it to very expensive. Yeah. yeah. So there are some desires that uh, we, we get rid of by fulfilling the you know, harmless types of, of desires. There's a very interesting conversation that takes place between the Holy Mother and I think uh, Swami Arupananda, Rasbihari Maharaj. When he says, Mother, I said for meditation, all these little desires come into the mind. Mm -hmm. She said, very good. He said, very good, let them come to the mind, let them leave. <laughs> Don't harbor them. These little things that uh, uh, we think. So this is what I call bucket list desires. There are things that, yeah, once in my lifetime I want to do it. I went to Rio and I, I did the gliding off of the cliff. 
Well, not that it was a big desire or anything, but uh, so I, I did it once. No desire to do it again. I had a tremendous desire to go to Kedarnath. I went. It was fantastic. Everything I could have hoped for. Not at least been disappointed. No desire to go again. I did it. So some desires we can get rid of that way. Uh, so we have to analyze very carefully. Some desires are good desires. So Thakur says that they don't even belong in the category of, of a desire. That they eliminate other desires. He would give some nice uh, illustrations. There's something called Inche. Huh? Inche shock. It's a type of green leafy vegetable. I don't know what it is exactly. He said that normally green leafy vegetable is spinach. Huh? It increases bile. But this other type of, of green, uh, not only doesn't it increase bile, it eliminates excessive bile. It's an antidote. So there, there are some desires, not, not only do they have no negative effect, but they counteract other desires. So we want to utilize them. Uh, so of course desire for God realization is that we have to increase. But even things, desire for holy company, desire uh, for solitude, desire to do spiritual practice, all of these. Uh, these are, are very good, positive, helpful desires. Uh, desire to help other people, to, to be good, kind, compassionate uh, individuals. These are all very positive things. So when it says here that prajahati, uh, all of these sort of comments, that uh, we have to understand that we can't live without some desire. Yeah. We can't live without some desire. Now, what about the desire for, for family, the desire for a good job, for all of these things? These are not bad, but uh, for, for God realization, we have to, that's why we have to fulfill these things. This is the purpose of the, of the Guryastashana, this the householder stage of life. Is the, the, the main purpose is so we fulfill these desires. They're good desires, but once we've done it, then say, oh, I did it. I fulfilled my duty. I raised my family. The children went to college. They're married. They, they have their own families. I'm content. I'm finished with it. So they, there are three types of desires that they talk about. And in, the, in monastic life, we have to renounce these at the very beginning that householder will renounce these uh, by reaching the Street. final stages of life. Vanaprastha huh? stage or this sannyasa. It doesn't have to be sannyasa stage, but it is that this uh, putreshana. Putreshana, this desire for offspring. And so for sannyasa, they have to just get rid of it. But, uh, uh, I let other people have children. It's nice. I like having nieces and nephews. No way interested in having my own children. I know what's involved in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they have to do it. The, the householder well, will get great joy out of children and get great heartache. This is what happens. There's no way around it. There's no way around it. Okay, so putreshana, then vitteshana, this desire for wealth. Now, is the householder allowed to, to have wealth? Of course. Yes. It's a very curious thing. The two things that Takur always talks about, comedy content, huh? mm -hmm. that this is, what is this? It's art and comma. These are the two aims of life for the householder. The two things that he said beware of are the two things that we're supposed to do in the householder <coughs> stage of life. Right? Yeah. So, uh, there's an art, but it has to all be governed by dharma. That's the thing. It has to be dharmic desire and all of this. So, at the householder stage of life, uh, we, we can have this vitta, vittesana, but the retired stage of life is, yes, I've, I've accumulated all of these things, let me see, even start giving them away. Uh, they won't come with me when I leave. This, uh, I don't need them anymore, so the vittesana, the locationa. The locationa has two meanings. One, there's some desire to, to have enjoyment in heaven. This is the other world. The other meaning uh, is public opinion. Mm -hmm. This location. Uh, this this uh, madness that we all have to, to be praised by other people, 
And if people criticize us, how it bothers us, to, to be free from all of that. So these, these types of, of things have to be you know, ultimately eliminated. For the householder, they have a different way of doing it. Uh, during the, the householder stage of life, we should live our lives in such a way that people respect us. Mm-hmm. That, should, that should mean something to us. If people that we respect respect us, then, then we should feel good about ourselves. Nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it. If we see people who are indifferent to the criticism of others, that's one thing. But if they live in such a way that they're open to criticism and it doesn't bother them, that's not a good thing. We should practice the audio. We should lead a good, upright type of, of, of life. So, this is not such a simple thing. If we say, prajahati yadas or kamad or to get rid of this, we, we have to understand that uh, these, these very strong desires, uh, the desire for name and fame, these become obsessions with people. For some people, this for desire for wealth, that uh, they can't help it, they have to have more than the next person. This desire to, for other people to respect them. This desire for enjoyment. This desire for, uh, and of course it goes to addiction even that these things have to be just eliminated. And some, sometimes uh, it's very difficult to do that. So, uh, we, we reach a state, and for us, we, we do it by emphasizing positive desires. Sri Ramakrishna was never for ripping something away without replacing it. He said if we, if we increase our desire for God-realization, or desire to lead a spiritual life or holy company or all of that, the others will naturally lose their force. They'll become less and less. We won't have to bother too much. So, O Pata, when one fully renounces all the desires that have entered the mind, Manogata, this, this word manas, this equally means heart. There's no real distinction in Sanskrit between heart and mind. Uh, half the time it's better to think of, of because desires reside within the heart they're very deep-seated things it's not such a, so much a, a mental thing and uh, we, we find with desire that how much control do we have over it? No now there are two things one, we don't have any control over the arising of a desire just like we don't have any control over the arising of a thought, at least in the beginning. But, do we act on it? That part is under our control. So a desire comes to do something. This is, this is what it means to be an adult. Huh? A responsible adult, we don't follow every desire. The desire comes to do something that will give us enjoyment, but we see that, no, it will be better if I let the other person have it. And then, we, then we check ourselves. We restrain ourselves. So, uh, by doing this, this will, will because of the deep seep desires, these are called vasanas. These vasana, or samskara, uh, these we can just, just by a, uh, our willpower, we can change these. These get changed very gradually through behavior. If we don't give them scope, if we don't let them play out, then it's like not watering a plant. It will die, eventually die on its own, and if we replace it with something else. So we may find that, yes, how did this desire come up in my mind after so many years when I thought I didn't have it all? Then we did, just don't pay attention to it. We'll find later, the, um, one, of the, one of the descriptions of this Tita Pranya is not that he has no desires, or she has no desires, but they enter into them without raising any, any waves. Just, just they'll, they'll experience them, they'll see them, they'll watch them like a little bubble that comes up from the bottom and, and disappears and goes and a little blip across the screen. Just observe it and watch it and say, oh, this is, so this is old. The mind is going back to the old me a little bit. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that curious? You don't care for these things anymore. But they may still come up, just out of habit, something like that. 
So uh, these these deep seated, whether we say within the subconscious, deep seated within the heart, uh, as a samskara, as a vasana, all of these things. These vasanas, some things will not be eliminated. Some things we simply have to just disregard. They 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 come with the territory. They come with it with having a human body. These I call Darwinian, huh? Darwinian things that. Uh, Darwin, he recognized that there are common things upon all species that procreation. Huh? If that isn't an essential basic desire, a species won't continue. Then this desire, this, this selection, the, the competition, and all of these things, they're, they're natural to the animal part of our being. We're also part of the animal kingdom. So some of these vasanas are, are existential, they're universal. And we just have to, to deal with it and, and not be too much affected by it. Uh, this uh, karma especially. With karma, very often, we, we'll talk about karma as desire. It really means lust. And we don't talk about it too much. It's a, it's a touchy subject. <laughs> but but uh, this is something that uh, we should understand is natural to the human being as it is to every animal species. Swamiji said a very interesting thing once. He said, well, I called it unholy that uh, quality or characteristic which uh, allowed my mother to give birth to me. He loved his mother. He thought his mother was pure and perfect and everything. So we, we shouldn't put too much of a uh, look upon these things as unholy or, or uh, sinful or wicked or anything. We'll understand them as, as natural, natural things. There's an expression, Puri Deho Ure Chai Tove Shadhar Gun Gai. That means, uh, when will you sing the praises of a sadhu? That means that, oh, he led a perfectly pure life and everything. At what point is it safe to, to start praising him that way? When the body is burned and then and the, and the ashes fly up into the air. <laughs> Before that, I think they could have been. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you've heard that expression? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Dukeshu. Now, what do we do in the midst of, of where in the next verse? In the midst of sorrow, all the different things that will come to us in, in life that we have no control over. That it may be to us personally, it may be to family members, it may do a, be a, our community, whatever. This is The mind is, uh, is not agitated or disturbed. We have this, this uh, uh, concept of uh, the, the mind automatically reacting to external situations. Mm -hmm. uh, this the distinction between a person of, of realization or a person of self-control is that that person doesn't automatically react to, thing, to things but can act, action rather than reaction. The automatic reaction uh, to uh, all of the negative things that come to us is the mind will become udvig, this, uh, this udvega, this, it, it means that it's turbulent, there's this agitation that the mind is, is gets completely disturbed. Completely. Do you feel uneasy? Uh, uneasy or even more than uneasy. Sometimes we just uh, lose ourselves completely. We break down, all sorts of things happen. Then, sukeshu. Then, what happens when uh, very joyful things come to us? Vigada mm -hmm. spriya. Then we don't we don't have this this tremendous thirst desire for uh, always being up in positive things and and uh, always always being joyful and everything. That means that we're we're trying to seek that that in between thing doesn't mean just some safe area where okay uh, as long as I'm not suffering I'm, I'm willing to give up happiness. It doesn't mean that. It means that this 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 calmness this level this uh, it's a feeling of, of, of tremendous safety. Uh, 
that I'm, I'm, I'm free. I'm not at the mercy of external things. Mm. That I can simply watch everything. I can observe. That the mind won't get disturbed. It won't get too happy at good things. It won't be upset at, at negative things. This is Raga Duesha. We everything, everything for us is Raga Duesha. The whole life is involved in avoiding things we don't like and seeking things we like. Raga Duesha. Mm. Huh? If we can be free from those two things, then life becomes very simple. I have this theory, it's a very nice theory. I recommend this, it's a very nice theory. <laughs> this, everybody wants raga, everybody wants to do things that they like to do. Nobody wants to do things they don't like to do. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. We'd like to spend the whole life only doing things that we like to do. Sure. Is there any way to do it? Like I have a no here. No. Mm -hmm. Anybody? Like everything. Ah! Learn yeah. to like everything. Learn to like whatever we do, then we'll only do what we like. Yes, it can be done. Yeah. There's, there's another expression. Uh, uh, if, if you like the work that you do, you'll never work a day in your life. <laughs> what is that again? If you, if you like the work that you do, so when your career and everything, you like it, then you'll never work a day in your life. Right. <laughs> Huh? Like that means play, it'll be enjoyment. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yeah. So uh, if we can learn to like whatever we we do or whatever we have to do and everything, then we'll only do things we like all that time. Yeah. I I know this to be true because we join the monastery and, and we have to do everything. From cleaning toilets, you know, to uh, to pulling weeds, to washing dishes, to uh, and uh, I would see that uh, we would do it week by week. One week uh, would be your worship week. One week would be your cooking week. One week would be off, and you do your other things. That uh, that half of the time monks were were you know um, I can't wait till my cooking week is over. <laughs> <laughs> or some didn't like to do the worship. I can't wait till that's over. <laughs> and uh, but then I saw that we had some that uh, they looked forward to each one and they enjoyed each one and so I learned that I learned to, to do that and uh, everything uh, when it comes to work everything can be can be raised to a very high level so that we we can see the beauty of everything I had a wonderful experience once I was uh, stuck in LaGuardia Airport <laughs> That, uh, that there was a terrible storm and, and all the flights were, were canceled. I had to sit there for a long time. And this uh, window washer came. Yeah. And he sprayed everything and everything. And, and with such expertise and such care, how he did it with such concentration. I was mesmerized. <laughs> yeah. And, and for us, we think, oh, I have to clean the windows. <laughs> you know, what a chore and everything. And you could see that uh, it was so fully engaged yeah. in that and, and engrossed in it. It was beautiful, like watching ballet or something. It was a really wonderful experience. Yeah. And if we understand that all work is worship, mm -hmm. that's the key, of course. I'm here. Swami Shahanandaji used huh. to tell me huh. the maximum time I did, I did wash the dishes and the utensils. <laughs> uh, and then I told him when I came to this country after I got married, every time I will go to the sink, I will cry and cry and cry. Swami just asked me, why did you cry? I said, I thought I am a maid servant here. I yeah. have, never did this one in yeah. India. <laughs> Then he said, but I liked it. That's what he told me. He should have said every day, I like it, what I do. This this was when he was uh, 14, 15, 16 years right. old. That's what and, he was and Holly Lodge, and Holly one day, Lodge, one day That he would go, and that was his job, that he would wash all the right. utensils. Yeah, and these are puja things and things yeah. and everything. So, yeah. He said and he had, he had such a pure mind that, <coughs> uh, that he understood it. But, yeah, if we understand that everything is worship, and we do everything as an offering. Uh, but even with, if we don't have that, if we just see the purity of work and the freedom that comes from work, if, if, we, if we really can do it with a concentrated mind and we, we see the challenge involved in it, the desire to do it perfectly, mm -hmm. the dakshita, this, this perfection, mm -hmm. huh? 
This, this is one of, one of the definitions we have of yoga. Karma Sukha This is skillfulness in act, action. This is the type of yoga. Then we can really learn to, to appreciate and enjoy and see the beauty in each and everything that we do. And when we watch, uh, watch people work. If you go and just watch people who do manual labor, huh? those who, who, really, who really understand the secret of work, You'll, you'll see how concentrated their minds are and uh, how important it is for them to do things perfectly. So this is a great lesson uh, to, to uh, be able to uh, keep the mind perfectly focused and concentrated and we see that the joy will come from, from all different types of work. So this, then there's no dvesha. Everything raga. There's everything that we enjoy doing. There's nothing we try to avoid. Nothing, and uh, we have to make sure that the things that we enjoy that we don't get attached to it. Well, I get attached to it when I enjoy everything. Huh? It can be taken away. It can be taken away. Yeah, of course, but we uh, we. Everything will, will be taken away. We, we shouldn't be. There's nothing that we have that, won't, that we won't leave behind us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, and even while we have it, do we own it? Mm -hmm. What can we possess? We can't possess anything. Yeah. Kasya Swidhana. This uh, this last pada of the first verse of the Isha Upanishad uh, is is uh, it has two meanings. One is Mahagridha Kasya Swidhana, that uh, don't covet anybody's possession, anybody's wealth or possession or anything. The other explanation is don't covet anything. For who does wealth belong to? Kasya Swidhana. Uh, who, who, who owns anything? Do we own the house that we live in? No. Of course, most people do the bank no. owns it. <laughs> but even if it's paid off, do we own it? What does it mean to own something? Do we own this body of ours? I'll tell you a beautiful story about Swami Bhudeshananiji. Right. He was president of our order for many, many years. And uh, he lived to be, I think, 97 or something, right over old age. And he had a lot of the ailments, illnesses, and things. And uh, he was in the hospital uh, towards the very end. And the doctor said that yes, we can we can uh, prolong his life by doing one more surgery, maybe there's a stent or something. I don't remember what it was. And they all looked at each other and said, "How could we possibly ask him at that age to go through another uh, surgery?" Anyway. So then finally, one of them, probably Swami Amastan, he was very close with him. He went to him and said, "This is what the doctors are saying that we hesitate to even ask you." But if you're willing to do it, then then all of your disciples and all of us will have the blessing of your presence, you know, for at least another six months here, something like that. Or are you willing to do it? And he said, when I joined the order, I gave everything to Takur. I don't claim anything of my very own, including this body. He said, if it's the will of all the trustees and all of you that this body continues to live longer, then you decide whatever you decide is fine with me. Mm -hmm. So even his own body, he didn't count as his own possession. Huh? So what to speak of the house and clothes and all of these things. We use these things for time, then we get rid of them and everything. And what was his answer? So yeah, he had the surgery. He had the surgery? He said, whatever you all decide. Yeah, because so, he gave, so they did, yeah. he did it on his body. Yeah. He said, I gave it. Yeah. yeah. The, the story of a man on a train, who was a local train, he was on for a long time, but he sees the conductor go up to each person mm -hmm. and he says, uh, is this your seat? This is my seat. Show me your ticket. He shows his ticket, then he gets off to the next station. Another person comes, sits there. Conductor says, is this your seat? Yes, this is my seat. And he says, everybody's saying it's my seat. <laughs> <laughs> and they're on it for, for one stop, and they get off, and so <laughs> So this is life. Yeah. Yes, this is my house, and this is my car, and these are all, all my possessions and everything. Nothing belongs to us. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so here it says that monk. See, Shankaracharya, he he won't give up. <laughs> so uh, we don't have to take it that way. You all, all have your own translation, huh? You won't see monk there. Uh, this is this is uh, he he takes Muni. Muni just means a sage. It doesn't have to be a monk. It could be a rish, rishis could be Munis. Also, they were all married people. Muni. Uh, his mind is undisturbed, unperturbed in sorrow. And he's free from longing for delights. Let me happy, happy things. Sukeshu. And uh, Vita Raga Bhaya Kurodha. This Raga will be, here it will mean it, 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 some type of attachment. Raga has many different meanings, can even mean anger. Uh, attachment, fear, and, and anger. All of these are Vita, they fled. He's free from all of these. So this is uh, another qualification of this, uh, of this, this, sage, stita dhir mori And he's called the sage of, of study wisdom. Ya sarvatra abhisnehas tat tat prapya subha subham na bhinandati na doeshti tasya pragnya prashtita. Tasya pragnya prashtita. This is exactly what it means to be stita pragnya. His, his knowledge, his wisdom is well established. We, we may reach a state where sometimes uh, someone says something to us and we're in a good mood and we laugh. And other times we don't laugh. This is someone who's established in that. That means that, that uh, the mind will never swerve from that. So, uh, un Avisneha. So he doesn't have any of this uh, real attachment or affection for anything anywhere. Uh, Tattat prapya shubha shubham. That means uh, tat tat. First tat means shubha, second tat means ashubha. And uh, abhi, nanditi, and dvashti goes one goes with one, the next goes with the other. This is what yatasankhya, that uh, is respectively. Respectively, so that means that uh, when something shubha comes, shubha means something this. Uh, Auspicious. Auspicious. Yes. Auspicious. That there's uh, something that pleases us, that we like, there's a good sign, there's a good fortune, that whatever it is, then he doesn't rejoice. He goes, okay, it came. If it hadn't come, my life won't be that, that, that much different, and it may even leave the next day. So he doesn't rejoice. Then when Ashubha comes, then he, he has no negative reaction. He, he, he says, yes, whatever comes, let it come. Let it come. This is also Sahishnuda. This is also this forbearance. This this forbearance that yes, uh, whatever comes, I'll, I can put up with it. I can bear it. I can live with it. It's not the end of the world, no matter what what happens. So such a person, his his knowledge is firmly fixed. The wisdom of that person remains established who has not attachment for anything anywhere. That's the first thing. Who neither welcomes nor rejects anything, whether good or bad, when he comes across it. So, uh, that means we say, okay, this is a position of tremendous strength. Whatever comes, comes. Let it come. Either it's my karma, or it's your will, or it's simply chance. Whatever comes, let it come. I'm not this body, I'm not this mind. I, I would, uh, whatever comes, it'll leave also. That, uh, I, I won't allow the mind to be affected by that, or my joy comes from within anyhow. Why do I care about these external things? There is a very f- famous uh, expression, I think it goes way back to some Persian expression, this too shall pass. The very, very helpful thing, whenever we're in the midst of some difficulty, this too shall pass. We, we have to remember times when we're in the midst of something we thought it'll never end, and this pain will never go away, and somehow we get through it, it passes. So this also will pass, this too shall pass. Uh, we go to six, huh? Okay, so we'll do one more. Yadasam Maharate Chayam Kurmangani Vasarvasya Indriyani 
Now we're getting to uh, the ability of, the, of these great souls to withdraw their mind. This is Pratyahara. The Pratyahara is the first step of the four final stages of uh, Ashtanga Yoga where we, we can withdraw the mind from the senses, then we can fix it in Havana, then we can go into meditation in Dhyana and Samadhi. So this is the first thing. Now, it's a beautiful illustration. If you, if you see a turtle, huh? yeah. and the turtle gets scared, you, you hit the turtle on the back, then the head comes in and the four legs come in. So this is a symbolic of the five senses. So what do we do in meditation? we withdraw as, as if we're pulling them all inside so that there's no connection with the outside. So in, in what we're actually doing is we're cutting off the mind from the senses because unless the mind is present we won't hear something. Mm -hmm. huh? Just because some vibrations come and strike the eardrum doesn't mean that they will hear something if the mind isn't there. If, if we're engrossed in reading a book so many times that'll happen that uh, some children get so engrossed in something that you can, you can call them over and over and over again and they won't, either they won't listen or they won't hear. They may not even hear, because they may pretend that they're not hearing. But, but uh, this, this is something that uh, those who have perfect control over the mind, that they can withdraw so that uh, these senses are not operative. And we sit for meditation. We also do it. And Swamiji says in one place that uh, we do it unconsciously as, when, as uh, when we're reading a book, something like that. If we can do it unconsciously, we can do it consciously. Mm -hmm. So if uh, we sit for meditation, there's nice incense burning. We're smelling that incense. Mm -hmm. Will we be smelling it the whole time we're meditating? At some point, at some point we forget it. At some point the mind... Uh, maybe not a good thing. Maybe the mind we're, we're daydreaming or something. But at some point, the mind is no longer connected to the sense of smell, and, and we're not aware of the smell of the incense. So if that can happen, then we understand that the mind has to be present, and we also understand that it doesn't have to be something just by chance. That the mind was thinking of something else. If we have that, we can withdraw the mind from it. So, just as the tortoise or the turtle can do it through his own willpower and his own decision to sit for meditation, and, and it, it can only be done if there's some internal object that will, will capture our imagination. Now, I have a theory that uh, if, you, if you look at the type of, of meditation that we, that we practice, uh, it will involve all of the senses internally. Internally. If uh, we, we want to not hear external things, then we repeat mantra. So we have this internal sound, internal hearing is going on. If we don't want to see external things, then we project the image of the Ishtadevata. We try to see that. Yeah? So we do that with, uh, with uh, all of our senses. We don't want to feel the external things. We try to feel the heart center. And then smell and, and taste. Not, not so clearly, but at least those three main things. This visualization and this placing within the heart and this repetition of the, of the mantra. These are the ways that we can uh, replace the external sense of, of the hearing and seeing and feeling with an internal sense of hearing, seeing and feeling. So this is one benefit to that type of meditation which involves mantra and ishta devata. And also this, when we talk about placing the ishta devata within the heart center, or other, wherever we do, it means that uh, at least in the beginning, at least in the beginning of our meditation, uh, we have to try to fix the mind on that. See, the mind can, can be connected with any part of the body at any time. Right, right now, uh, your feet are touching the ground. Right? You can feel that. Right? You can concentrate on that. 
now, at the same time you're not feeling the head in your, the hair on your head. Huh? Because it's, the mind will only be in one place at one time. Everything else we feel in the background. But it's, but it's, so, uh, this sense of touch, uh, we can also do it internally. How do, we, how do we fix the mind internally on the heart center? We have the movement of the, of the breath, we have the beating of the heart. We, we have some feeling, internal feeling within through these two organs. And these are the two vital organs. And these are the two organs that are affected by emotion. Mm. We get upset, we breathe faster, and the heart beats faster. Mm -hmm. we, we fall in love. Huh? The heart flutters. <laughs> huh? All sorts of things happen. Mm. Yeah. So these, these are ways of, of uh, bringing the limbs in and internalizing everything by replacing this external sense perception with some kind of internal sense perception. So it's 58, and when this, the sage fully withdraws the senses from the objects of the senses as a tortoise, fully withdraws the limbs, limbs and head also, so that because five senses, then his wisdom remains established. Okay, so we'll, we'll stop here. We have a break for an hour. And then at 7 we have our arati. And then we'll have the uh, next session. Next session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.